blood collection equipment. So we're going to get into all the different things you need to properly collect blood, what they are, what we use them for, and things of that nature. So some of the things that we're going to need for our blood collection equipment are antisep antiseptic cleaning solution. We're going to need bandages, collection tubes, gauze pads, gloves, marking pens, needle disposal containers, needle holders, needles, syringes with transfer device, tourniquets, and winged infusion sets. So this is a list of many of the things we need. So we're going to start to get into some of those other things and um, a little bit more detail about what these are, what they look like, and why we use them. So blood collection equipment tray. So this is sort of what this looks like. It's sort of a device we use to organize all of our equipment. As you can see in here, there's a lot of different equipment. We have collection tubes. You can tell there's needles in here. There's a sharps container. You see a biohazard bag, that bag that has the biohazard symbol on it. Um, I see gauze pads. We see um, tape and other things of that nature. So this is what we use to keep everything organized and in one place so it's available and ready for us. Um, there's alcohol or, or antiseptic cleaning solution to clean before you do the blood draw. So all these things are there. So we have everything we need and we're ready to go um, when we walk in to do the blood draw. It's always important that we make sure that our um, blood collection equipment tray that we're using or the cart that we're using is full and fully stocked and ready for us. We always want to make sure we're prepared. The next thing we're going to talk about is a tourniquet. So a tourniquet is a device we use to make it easier to find the veins for a venipuncture. Um, it prevents the venous flow, all right, um, out of the arm, causing the veins to bulge. So it sort of keeps that um, blood in the veins within anywhere below where we put the tourniquet. And so what happens is the veins become to start to bulge. So they're easier to see or they're easier to feel, depending on the person. These are, um, they have latex and non-latex bands. They usually measure about one to a half inches wide and about 15 inches long. They come in non-latex again once um, due to people of allergies. So these are an example of what a tourniquet looks like. So if you've ever had your blood drawn or seen somebody get their blood drawn, you've seen the phlebotomist um, or the nurse or um, whoever was doing the procedure um, put a tourniquet on. So these are some examples of what tourniquets look like. When we go to apply the tourn tourniquet, it should be placed three to four inches above the site we want to use for the venipuncture, all right? So say we want to go in that intercubital fossa, all right? Um, we would want to go three to four inches above that. The CLSI, which is the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, indicates that once a tourniquet has been used, it should be disposed of to reduce the risk of spreading infection. All right, so we use it once and we throw it away. We don't reuse it on patients. All right, that's what the CLSI standards are. So when it comes to cleaning the puncture site, so when I say puncture site, I'm talking about where we're going to be drawing blood from. It's important that we use anti, um, that you know the difference, first of all, between antiseptics and disinfectants. Um, they are used to reduce the risk of infection. Antiseptic refers to an agent used to clean living tissue. That means um, to clean the skin. Where disinfectants refer um, to an agent used to clean a surface other than living tissue. So cleaning equipment is going to be disinfectant. Antiseptic is cleaning our living skin. So cleaning the skin before you do your blood draw. What it does is this antiseptic prevents sepsis or infection. All right, they're used to clean the patient's skin before routine venipunctures um, to collect or prevent contamination by normal skin bacteria. For maximum effectiveness, we should make sure the antiseptic um, should be left in contact with the skin for 30 to 60 seconds. So it's not a quick swipe and be done. You should really rub it around the area for a minimum of 30 to 60 seconds. You should not fan or blow on the site to speed up drying. What this will end up doing is introduce more bacteria, all right? So just allow it to dry at its own speed. Do not try to fan or blow on it. 
Um, most commonly, what we're going to use are these prep pads or the prepackaged alcohol pads. All right, so this is what we're going to use to clean. You'll see these when we get to clinical. We're going to, or when, excuse me, when you come to lab, we're going to go over all this different equipment one by one. Vacutainer tubes. These are most commonly used for laboratory blood collection. They're color coasted based on any ad additives within the tube. So there's different things within them like anticoagulants or clot activators or preservatives and a few additives that may be present in the tubes. And when the type of additive that is in there is dependent on what the what they're testing for. All right. So once again, they're color coded. So every um, tube that has color top A, we'll say, has the same additives in it. That way, you know exactly which one you're supposed to use. And we'll get into that a little bit more here shortly. So these evacuated collection tubes, they're color-coded once again. Um, tubes hold blood for later testing in the laboratory. And each tube, once again, contains different sets of add additives, um, which they're chemically designed to promote or prevent certain changes in the blood. Which tube we're going to use, like I just mentioned, is going to be depend on the test that is ordered. A critical part of your training about you knowing is learning and memorizing which tube to use for each test, all right? There's a lot of different tests out there, and we're going to have a lot to learn about these tubes. So for these collection tubes, these tube tops are either thick rubber toppers or rubber toppers with plastic tops, Okay. The plastic top minimizes the chance of an aerosol spray forming when the stopper is removed. Um, these tubes themselves are made of either glass or shatter-resistant plastic. You're going to see more of the shatter-resistant plastic, most likely. Tubes are evacuated, so the measured amount of blood will flow in easily. They are, they are available in a variety of sizes, basically anywhere from 2 milliliters to 50 milliliters. So they come in different sizes. It's important that we match the needle gauge to the tube. So a 23 gauge needle on a 15 milliliter tube will likely cause hemolysis, for instance. So if you need a small needle, use two small tubes instead of um, the larger one. Partial draw tubes are also available. Um, and what these um, partial draw tubes are is they have a smaller vacuum. So when we say vacuum, that means that... Um, it's pulling the blood in, all right? So it's vacuuming out, all right? So it's sucking that blood in, and it's a little bit smaller, so it's not going to pull as much um, of that bull, um, that, um, the volume of the blood. The best tube size for when you're going to draw blood is really going to depend on several different things. Um, every test requires a particular minimum volume of blood for the sample. It can range anywhere from 1 to 10 milliliters or even more than that. So that's an important factor. Um, wherever, whatever laboratory you work in or whatever facility you work in, they're going to have um, the minimum amount of, of volume required for each test. So it's important that you always, always make sure you meet that minimum. You could always draw more than you, than you need. Um, but you need to make sure you're meeting that minimum of, amount of blood in each um, tube you have there. Or for, excuse me, for that specific test. So sometimes you may have to draw multiple tubes or get a larger size of tube. And then each tube carries an expiration date. So it's important to make sure that you're checking the expiration date and any tubes that are unused and have expired are discarded. So um, glass red top tube has no additives. Um, all the other tubes do contain more additives. So that's just something to be aware of. Any tube containing an additive, additive must be inverted. So the only one that doesn't need to be invert inverted is the glass red top tube. So what inversion does when, we, when I say it needs to be inverted, what it does is... Um, it mixes everything, um, the additive with the blood. So what an inversion is, or what we're doing when we invert it, is we gently turn the tube over and then back upright again. So upside down and back up, and that equals one inversion. So turning it upside down and then back up is one inversion. 
We do not want to shape the two because this will cause hemolysis. So the exact number of inversions, inversions needed varies by the tube type. Most of them need a minimum of five to eight inversions. So anticoagulants, that is one of the additives that may be placed that might be in a tube. So what an anticoagulant does is it prevents blood from clotting from clotting. So sodium or potassium or EDTA um, binds calcium. Thereby, what it does is inhibiting the coagulation of the blood. All right. So it stops the blood from clotting. That's the biggest thing you need to know in the most simple terms. Um, other additives that bind calcium include sodium, citrate, potassium oxalate, and SPS. Other anticoagulants like heparin linked with sodium or lithium or ammonium inhibits clotting by preventing the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Having the correct ratio of blood to anticoagulant is important, so you must take care to fill the tube completely. Anticoagulants must be mixed well by gently and repeatedly inverting the tube. So remember, we just talked about inverting, turning it upside down and back up. And once again, this is a gentle process. It's not a shaking. The choice of anticoagulant is determined by the test to be done. And we're going to learn which tubes have this anticoagulant, which ones don't, and what tube goes to what test. So don't worry about that too much now. We're just sort of explaining what these additives are, just so you understand. So when we go to learn about the tubes, what they do, why we run the, or what tests they go with, you have sort of an idea of what we're talking about. Clot activators. So clot activators, they're promoting clots to form. They're promoting coagulation. Clotting in plain serum tubes takes about 60 minutes, while clotting in serum tubes with clot activators only takes 30 minutes. So having these clot activators takes that time in half, okay? Clot activators may be adhered to the side of the tube. Therefore, the sample must be inverted five times to allow the blood to come in contact with the activator. So once again, you're learning inversion is an important part. After you draw the blood, after you fill the tube with blood, you're turning the sample upside down and back up gently a minimum of five times. Polymer, polymer gel is another example of an additive. This is also called thixotropic gel. It's an inert synthetic substance whose density is between that of cells and that of blood serum or plasma. So when the specimen is um, goes through the centrifuge, the gel becomes a liquid and moves between the lower cell layer and the upper serum or plasma layer. So it hardens again after standing and forms a barrier between the two layers. That way, what it does is it prevents contamination and allowing and um, allowing any more easy separation. So in the light green top tube, for example, it's used for determining potassium. What the gel does is it prevents the plasma from being contaminated by the potassium released by the red blood cells. So that's just sort of an example of the polymer gel. This will tend, once again, make a lot more sense when we continue to learn more about these tops. So each combination of additives is distinguished by a different color top. However, different manufacturers may use slightly different color coding schemes, so just, or schemes, so just make sure you're paying attention. So with the vacutainer tubes, they are color-coded yellow, blue, red, green, lavender, gray, and then royal blue and Yellow is used for blood culture in sterile specimens. It is an ACD solution. Additive is used is sodium. So SPS is there, all right, and it's going to inhibit or complement any phagocytosis, excuse me. So the specimen is whole blood, so we're collecting blood. Um, and once again, this is ye yellow, and we're doing this for blood culture or any sterile specimens. So what we're looking for is this tube is used to recover microorganisms that, cause are, that are causing blood infection. So this is what the yellow tube is for. The light blue tube, all right, for this is for coagulation tests. So the additive is a sodium citrate. 
<clears throat> it prevents coagulation by binding calcium. So, all right. It is advised to draw two to three milliliters of blood in a tube without additives before drawing this tube, okay? So what they're telling you is, remember, the red tap tube does not have additives. So what they're saying is you should draw two to three milliliters of blood in the red tap tube and then use this light blue tube. You're going to fill the tube completely to maintain the ratio, all right? Because remember, this is for coagulation tests. And then it's important we invert this a minimum of three to four times. So you're turning that three to four times. It's quite, um, commonly used for PT, PTT, and um, carbon tests. <coughs> Excuse me. The next one is our red or um, plastic or glass tube. There's no additive required. Commonly used for chemistry testing and blood bank testing. Um, remember the glass one has no additive in it whatsoever. The plastic sh tube should be inverted gently five times because there are clot activators in the plastic. The glass tube is the only one that does not have any additive. If it's, if the blood is collected in a red top plastic or glass tube, it takes 60 minutes to clot. All right, so the serum is separated by the centrifuge machine after clotting. Gold, light green, or green gray. So once again, on the left, you see the light green. On the right, you see the green gray. Stat and routine chemistry test. So the additives in this are going to be heparin and polymer gel. Plasma is the specimen. And these are also called plasma separator tubes, PSTs. You see green here. The additive used in this is a sodium, sodium, sodium heparin, um, lithium, and a lithium heparin natural anticoagulant. And what this does is it inhibits thrombin. So this is for stat and routine chemistry tests, ammonia, electrolytes, arterial blood gas tests, and depending on the um, which is these tests depend on which heparin additive is used, whether it's the sodium heparin, the lithium heparin, or the ammonium, ammonium heparin. It's a plasma specimen for this. Commonly used for routine chemistry testing. Lavender. These are one of the most popular ones you're going to use. We're going to use these for all our CBC, our complete blood counts. This is one of the most common tests that you're going to see run. All right, sedimentation rate. Um, routine immunohematology testing as well. The additive is EDTA. Our specimen is whole blood. <clears throat> All right, so this is the lavender. Once again, one of the most common ones you're going to use because of that CBC, that complete blood count. The gray two, the add additives in here, um, is a anti-glycolytic agent. So sodium fluor fluoride is one of the additives. It's a preservative that inhibits glycolytic action and potassium oxalate. So it's an anticoagulant that binds, binds calcium. So anticoagulant, keyword take out of that. We're going to use this for lactic, lactic acid measurement tests, glucose tolerance tests, fasting blood sugar, and blood alcohol levels. Royal blue. When we um, collect samples for um, things like nutritional studies, trace metals, um, drug, therapeutic drug monitoring, and toxicology results, okay? The additives include heparin, EDTA, or none at all. The tubes are chemically clean, and the stoppers are specifically formulated to prevent the release of small amounts of materials that could contaminate the sample and give um, results that are ina inaccurate. Um, it's also used for testing aluminum. Um, the tan top is used for um, lead testing. Um, so tan here is the lead analysis. So the additives are heparin in here. So once again, the tan is only for lead analysis. 
The pearl is for viral loads when the additive is a polymer gel with EDTA. Now our orange hemoguard closure, or what you see the speckled yellow gray here, we use this for stat chemistry tests. The additive is thrombin, all right? This tube allows for five minute clotting time. That's why stat, meaning immediately, as soon as possible. It's used for patients on anticoagulation therapy. So they're on blood thinners. The next one is pink. This is for blood bank compatibility test. All right, so the additives are K2-EDTA. Um, it's similar to the standard lavender top, but its closure and label meet the standard set by the American Association of Blood Banks. So this one you only use for blood bank compatibility test. The black tube top is for sedimentation, sedimentation right, if I can speak today. Though um, it's often done with a lavender tube instead of the black, all right? So you can use the lavender tube as well for the sedimentation right. Um, it has a buffered sodium citrate additive. It's whole blood. It's important we fill the tube completely um, and, um, to make sure the ratio is met. The yellow non-sterile tube. All right, so non-sterile yellow tube. Um, what we're going to be testing is for the antigen, um, the, the HLA, the human leukocyte antigen. And um, what this is, is for paternity testing and tissue typing. It has an acid citrate dextrose additive. And what it does is um, the dextrose nourishes and preserves red blood cells. And the citrate is an anticoagulant. The next thing we're going to get into is the needle. So it's imp important to know that there's different parts of the needle. Needle. There's the bevel, the shaft, the threaded hub, and a rubber sleeve over the needle. So here's a few different parts. So we'll have the point here. So when we're looking at the bevel, all right? So the bevel is this point here. If you notice, it's on an angle. There's a point, and then there's the lumen. The lumen is the opening, all right? So the shaft is this long part of the needle, and the hub is this portion that's attached to the shaft of the needle. This gives you a great visual of each of the parts. So with the needle, the point, which is a sharp needle, provides smooth entry into the skin with minimum amount of pain. So that's why that point is there. The bevel or the angle is what eases the shaft into the skin and prevents the needle from coming out, um, or excuse me, not coming, coring out a plug of the tissue. The shaft, um, they, the shaft differs in both length and gauge, so you can have different size needles, okay? And the shaft is what determines the different size of the needle. For um, routine venipuncture, it's going to range from three fourth inches to one to one and a half inches long for standard needles. So that's sort of what we're looking at when it comes for the shaft, the size of the shaft for the needle. So with a needle, the sizes are differentiated by a gauge number. Gauge indicates the diameter of the needle. The smaller the number, the larger the needle diameter, and the higher the flow rate, okay? So smaller means larger in this one. So the smaller the, the gauge, all right, the larger the needle diameter. Smaller needles, needles are for certain lab tests and typically for use on children. Butterfly needle, or what we call the winged infusion set, is commonly used for, um, for blood draws. Um, it is very important that a procedure manual, which we what you'll find in your workplace, be followed regarding your specimen collection. Okay, so every facility has a little a few different policies they may follow. So it's just important that you follow through with that. Now a multi-sample needle. What a multi-sample needle is, is we use, um, we use this for a lot of our blood collections. So if you can see in this picture here, one tip of the needle penetrates the patient's skin. All right, so on the right-hand side here, where the bevel and the shaft is, that is the part that's penetrating the patient's skin or inserting into the vein to remove blood. The second one, so right here we have on the left the, the part that has the retractable sheath, all right? That's where we're putting 
that's going to pierce that rubber cap on top of the vacutainer tubes, all right, and allow that vacuum or that suction to occur, all right? The rubber sheath that's there is there to protect um, and covers the tip um, when it is not inserted in the tube. So once again, the shaft here, the part on the right, is what enters the skin of the patient into the vein. The part with this rubber cap, this rubber sheath that's retractable, is where we insert the tube. All right, it allows for easy insertion of the tube, all right, where that vacuum, that suctioning can occur from the, the, the pull the blood from the vein and into that tube. All right, so this is what we call a butterfly or wing needle. So we just talked about the multi-sample needle. This is what we call the butterfly wing or wing needles. A winged infusion set is... um. Also known as a wing collection set or butterfly is used when um, we're going to do venipuncture on small veins, all right? So typically th something like in the hands is what something we'd use this for. Where the multi-sample needle, we'd use though in that in the anti-cubital fossa typically. Um, elderly patients and pediatric patients are also ones we might use the butterfly needle on. Um, what it does is it allows for more flexibility when we're placing and manipulating the needle. Most commonly, it's a 23 gauge and 3 fourth, 3 fourth inches long. Now remember, the, um, the smaller the gauge, the bigger the diameter. So 23 seems large, but it's really smaller. The needle is held by a plastic butterfly. So if you see over here on the right, you can see maybe why it's called a butterfly, the green and the blue part of the needle. Okay, that is what the butterfly portion they're talking about. Um, and it's there for grip and it's connected to that that flexible tubing, that tubing that's sort of wrapped around by the needle and in the hub there, the syringe, <coughs> um, that's what you see there. So that's what your butterfly needle. So this is the syringe. A syringe is sometimes well, useful um, when we have a patient that has fragile or small veins. Um, Sometimes what will happen if they have really fragile small veins, what happens is we insert either that multi-purpose needle or excuse me, multi-sample needle or the butterfly needle. And when we connect um, the vacutainer tubes, sometimes that vacuum of the collection tube will collapse the vein, which will allow us not to get any more, um, it won't allow us to get any blood. So using a syringe to slowly pull back to bring that blood out, um, is a better option when you have somebody that has fragile veins. So instead of putting the container, you'll connect this syringe to the infusion set. So just like what we saw in the butterfly picture, if you notice that syringe was con connected to that one needle, the bottom picture, what they're doing is they're using that instead of the vacutainer to pull the sample, and then they'll use a needle to pierce the, um, the vacutainer and insert the blood from the syringe. Um, suction can just be applied gradually and slowly by drawing black this plunger. So as you can see, the plunger is um, labeled here on the picture and the barrel is labeled, all right? So the plunger you see would pull from the top and that's going to be done slowly. That way we don't collapse that vein, all right? Um, a safety transfer device must be used with a syringe, you know, whenever we're drawing with a syringe and we'll get into that a little bit more. Once again, a syringe is for somebody with fragile or small veins. That way you can control how much blood you're pulling out and you're doing that at a slow rate where the vacuum um, of the collection tube is just too much where it collapses that vein. All right, so we have safety devices here that we're going to talk about. So the safety device we're talking about here is on the left-hand side. These little like almost clear tubes that you see, all right, that's what the safety device is. So we're going to start with this multi-sample needle just to sort of see how they are used. So if you look at picture B for a second, you notice that we have the needle at the top that has its label. We then have the hub, and then we have the sheath needle, the bottom part, all right, of, picture, of B in the picture to the right. Now what happens with the safety device is as you look at picture A, the safety device is screwed into the hub, and we have that in place, and... What that allows is you can't accidentally um, stick your finger on that sheath needle because although there's a rubber cover over it, if you push hard, it can still cut you. So what that allows is it prevents is 
somebody from accidentally poking themselves. So you have this safety device, this clear tube, and then what you do is you stick the vacutainer tube up so that sheath needle inserts, and that's where that vacuuming starts to happen, all right? A needle adapter is a translucent plastic cylinder. So the needle adapter, the safety device is what we're talking about. One end has a small opening that accepts the multi-sample needle. The other end is a wide opening that accepts the collection tube. So what I just showed you a picture of. These da adapters can come in different sizes to fit different tubes. Of um, It's also important that you make sure you're choosing the adapter that fits the tube you are using. Um, adapters have a tube advancement mark indicating how far the tube can be pushed without it losing the vacuum. So what you want to do is you don't want to make sure you push that tube too far, all right, into the adapter. Because what can happen is that vacuuming will stop and now that um, sample is wasted or that tube is wasted. It will not pull any more blood into that vacutainer tube. It's important that we protect the puncture site. So this is where we're going to, our gauze come into play. After drawing blood, what we're going to want to do is you're going to need to stop that bleeding by applying pressure to the puncture site. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, two to three two-inch gauze pads. We're going to fold them into quarters. So we're going to fold it in half and then in half again. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply pressure to the puncture site. So where you drew blood from. And bleeding will usually stop within several minutes. You want to apply pressure. Um, if the patient is on any aspirin or any type of anticoagulant, so any type of um, blood thinner, it may take 10 to 15 minutes for that bleeding to stop. When the bleeding stops, you can then, um, the gauze can be placed with an adhesive. So what you can do is take tape or a bandage and wrap it around that around the gauze and the puncture site. Um you can tape the gauze in place um, using that adhesive bandage. Um, use of cotton balls instead of gauze is not recommended. And the reason for that is because co those cotton fibers, um, they can get trapped in the clot. And when we pull off the puncture site, they'll either tear the clot or and it could restart the bleeding. All right. So that's why we don't want to use those cotton balls. Those fibers sort of get trapped and they mess with the clotting, all right? Gauze is the best thing to use. Once again, those two-inch gauze pads and fold them in, in half and then half again. So that's what I mean by quarters. Needle disposal containers. This is the last um, equipment that we're going to talk about in this um, PowerPoint. So these are used to dispose any and all sharp objects, including needles. Once you have withdrawn the needle from the patient, it's important to know that you need to hand it with extreme care. We want to avoid any accidental needle stick. Um, a used needle is considered biohazardous waste, and it must be treated as such. So as you notice, there's stickers on there that show it is biohazard. Make sure you dispose of the needle with the adapter still attached immediately after of act activating the needle safety device. So some needles have a safety button on it that retract the needle. That way you can't accidentally stick, all right, um, yourself. So there's a little button. Some of them have it where there's a cover you can slide over the needle so you can't accidentally stick. And some don't have safety devices. So it just depends on what type of needle you're using. It's just important to remember you have to be very, very careful. Know who's around you and watch yourself and immediately put it in that um, the needle disposal containers or the sharps container. Um, they must um, be placed in a clearly marked puncture resistant biohazard disposal container, just like you see here. All right. These are hard plastic. We'll see them in clinical as well. All right. So we'll go over all this equipment with you in more detail, let you see them, feel them, know exactly what everything is. Um, the containers must be closable and sealable, puncture resistant, once again, leak proof and labeled with the collect biohazard symbol. That's really important. They, they come in all different sizes. There's little portable ones, there's 10 gallon ones, and everything in between. But it's important you always have this um, with you or around you when you're, um, when you're using needles because they should immediately go in there when they're finished. This is what's going to be a huge prevention of injury.